Well, that was Fifty Shades of Gay. 1950s Shades of Gay. Dominant pin is relevant to my interests. Correct. This scene gave me a third ovary, triplets, and a house in the suburbs with a white picket fence. Pin staring deep into a nin's soul like that? This is why Freen owes so many women child support. She needs to start wearing sunglasses in her love scenes. She has got to start being more responsible. You can't tell me that Lady Pin hasn't been planning to do that for a while. She has just been waiting for a chance to air quotes punish a nin. She is the punisher. The secrecy, the jealousy, the threats, the BDSM. She is so Scorpio coded. The neck push, the lip bite, the smiles. It's poetic cinema. I, for one, think using the towel in that way was very resourceful. We love a queen who recycles. Freenbeck always take it to 199 degrees Fahrenheit. What? Nowhere in Pine Palace is safe from their lesbian activity. Nowhere in Thailand is safe from their lesbian activity. This is why they're always taking a trip to the food markets, so they can stock up on calories to burn on lesbian activity. They keep those food markets in business. With respect and consent, I wish I was a towel. This episode was a starter, a main course, and a dessert, with complimentary biscuits to take home. Speaking of all things culinary, edible, delectable, well I guess the dining table is on theme for that. Right in front of the tea and biscuits, huh? Those tea and biscuits are going to need therapy. I thought the relaxing Nintendo music perfect for studying complemented this scene perfectly. That collarbone kiss belongs in the lesbian hall of fame. Episode 8. Halfway through baby. I feel like I've been reviewing this show for years. Soon you're just gonna see me start growing a very long wizard's beard because I've been reviewing this show for that long. This is the longest I've been committed to anything or anyone. Ever. This show is longer than my will to live. The cinematography, the setting sun. This is premium lesbian content. This episode was just romance wrapped up with a bow and delivered to us with love. And we should enjoy it because this is the last episode that we're going to know peace. From here on out, it's just going to be lesbian suffering. So we should cherish this episode like it's a tiny baby bunny. Hi guys, welcome to the video. And in today's video, I'm just going to be reviewing episode eight of The Loyal Pin. As usual, these videos are not scripted. It's just me and my gay nods bound together until the curse is lifted. So if this video is unhinged, if it makes no sense, I heard you were into that. So the episode begins by showing us a Nin's early return and she is dressed like a beautiful Ghibli character. Seriously, the outfits in this show are so dreamy. And Preek attaches herself to a Nin like a koala, but a supportive koala who understands that a Nin and Pin need some alone time for scientific reasons. The dog role play, it takes me back to the gap days. Who am I to judge, y you know? Anyway, a Nin watches Pin yearn yeah, in real time before she surprises her and we get a very emotional reunion. However, Pin is in her feelings because Anin did not tell her about this early return and chose to surprise her instead. Again, this is Scorpio behaviour. They want to know everything at all times. How do I know this is Scorpio behaviour? Because over half of my ex-girlfriends are Scorpios. I don't know how I'm sitting here alive either. But Anin explains herself and Pin eventually comes around because she decides that Anin has suffered enough through not eating and not sleeping from trying to get back to her. Anin is a woman of communication and we love that. And they waste no time in getting reacquainted in the lesbian way. This is their first ever afternoon smash and it's a milestone. Pin is scandalised by the idea of fine dining in the afternoon but Anin is a ravenous 24-7 kind of woman. This scene was actually so soft and full of cute details. Put every single kiss in an art museum. We get some very cute post smash snuggles and like I said, Pin is Scorpio coded. She doesn't miss anything and is interrogating Anin 
over a new perfume that she's wearing, and about her global collection of suitors back in England. Luckily, Anin has a silver tongue, a way with words, and is a woman of communication, so she's able to reassure Pin and restore the peace. She should work for the UN. Babe, wake up! A new servant just dropped. This actor was also in Gap, so it's like a Gap reunion. Pia is Anin's new personal assistant, and now there's four people in this relationship. Now they're ready to start a band. Anin is in full simping mode. Pin is in full simping mode. In fact, everyone is in simping mode. They're in love, love. They're in their dreamy, romantic, peaceful era. Pin is serving hardworking husband, and Anin is serving stay-at-home housewife. Hey, it is the 1950s. Alexa, play King Princess. Speaking of the 1950s, the fashion in this episode was so gorgeous. It's giving Thai price of salt. And then a wild Miss On appears. And given the fact that, you know, she assaulted Anin, it's kind of awkward. Lady Pin has no idea about this, and I'm not sure if Anin is ever going to really share with her the truth of what happened. I mean, she tells her that Miss On confessed to her in this episode, but she doesn't tell her about the assault. And I do think the fact that Anin hasn't shared everything with her is going to cause an issue at some point, given how kind of jealous and possessive Pin is. Maybe she's worried Pin is going to murder Miss On, which she is right to worry about that. And then it's deep romantic chats on the rooftops. The setting sun was a paid actor. The cinematography in this scene was so, so gorgeous. It's visually stunning. This is probably the most romantic romantic moment the show has had so far. There was something so poetic and meaningful about the two of them just sitting above and away from all of the pressures and expectations of the world below. Just being free to bask in their love together. The next thing we learn is that a welcome party is being thrown for an inn, and she's suspicious this is being thrown for her because they want to introduce her to potential suitors. And she makes it clear she's not interested. But she's a woman, and it's the 1950s. So it doesn't really matter what she wants. I think we're really starting to feel the heteronormative pressure being pushed down on Anin and Lady Pin in this episode, to the point where it's becoming impossible to brush aside or ignore like they have been doing. And we all knew this was coming, it's the 1950s, and the reality is they are both expected to be married to men, whether they like it or not, but it's still uncomfortable to watch. Leave lesbians alone. Preek has got her work cut out for her, as a lesbian defender. She's going to need to level up for the final boss. Of course, Pranot knows how to throw a party. He's a fruitcake. And yes, that's a reductive gay stereotype, but it's okay for me to say it because I'm an ally to gay people, or I have a gay best friend, or something like that. Also, Pranot does announce to the ladies that he's single in this episode, so perhaps he's not as fruity as we thought. And in fact, he's a progressive depiction of a straight man. Who knows? Over at Pine Palace, Pin has gone into Scorpio Overdrive and is threatening an in with punishment over any hypothetical flirtations she may partake in, which is not exactly a deterrent to an in. In fact, it seems more like an incentive for her. The towel era, it's a great era. It allows us to be blessed with yet another shoulder kiss. I love that whenever an in is reminded of Kuar, you can just see the violent thoughts forming upon her face. We love a passionate queen. And then the episode pretty much turns into a Thai version of Downton Abbey, with my queen serving high-class fashion, and Prince Tom Rong serving milady and anime pillows. Surrounded by men throwing themselves at you when all you really want is a woman. It's called the lesbian experience. And Anin resorts to eating meat like an uncouth westerner to get rid of them. The way she tore into that carcass was a warning sign. Anyway, Lady Pin watches the Downton Abbey-esque dinner that's unfolding with much Scorpio suspicion from afar. And Kua joins her. Uh, and Anin hates this as much as the rest of us. They sit down at the dinner table together and the lesbian jealousy is at dangerous levels. 
The Kill Bill sirens can be heard around the world. And Nin starts drinking to stop herself from throwing a knife across the table. There was so much lesbian jealousy in this episode it broke the meter. Anyway, and Nin gets so drunk, her and Pin end up not only kissing, but swapping DNA samples in plain sight. Caution is thrown to the wind. Prince and Anne sees this swapping of DNA samples, and that's an image he has of his sister in his head for the rest of his life. He is going to need to attend therapy alongside the tea and biscuits. A bonus of Drunken Inn is we get to see how much Lady Pin takes care of her in that state, and it's really cute. She's an acts of service woman. You can always see just how much Pin cares for a Nin with the way she looks after her. It's really beautiful. But as soon as a Nin sobers up, the interrogation begins. Or rather it resumes because the interrogation has been ongoing throughout this entire episode. Let's just be real. And a Nin finally tells Lady Pin some of what happened with Miss On. Again, it's not the whole truth and I do think that's going to cause an issue down the road. But even these half-truths and reassurances extracted from a Nin via interrogation do not satisfy Lady Pin. Because at this point, she's just looking for a reason to act out her 1950s Shades of Grey fantasy. And as a result, even Lady Ung gets accused of having designs on Pin's property. Again. Girl, they are related. But as far as Pin's concerned, Lady Ung is a woman who dared to be within the proximity of her woman. And that's all that matters. Thus begins the 50th round of lesbian activity. The chest kiss. The neck kiss. The lip bite. The switch up. The towel improvisation. The violins. The shaking. And then finally, the forehead kiss. This is a masterpiece that belongs in the Lesbian Hall of Fame. And the episode ends with Prince and Anne processing what he saw earlier. He's processing, that's a lot for a man of the 1950s. Next episode looks messy as hell. Like reality TV levels of messy. If we thought the lesbian jealousy was bad in this episode, we haven't seen anything yet. I wouldn't be surprised if next episode turns into a murder mystery. Prince and Anne knows, but they don't know that he knows. Kua and Miss On join them on this trip too? What could possibly go wrong? I'm scared. Okay guys, thanks for watching. Let me know your thoughts on episode 8 down in the comments section below. Let me know what your favourite moment from this episode was. There's a lot to choose from. Don't forget to subscribe for instant disappointment and I'll see you guys soon. Bye.